That's the last thing in the world you need tonight. <laughs> a man needs to know his limitations. And there's a big one when it comes to enjoy music. Nobody enjoys music more than me. But uh, singing? No, that's not my thing. Look, turn to Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 10. We'll start reading verse number 8. Luke chapter number 2, verse 8. Now, this is the beloved physician, and he is a historian. Luke chapter number 2, and verse number 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. I can imagine. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word and anoint the messenger. In thy holy name, amen. amen. I'm going to read it tonight the way some folks would read this. And uh, here's the way they'd read this. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to the elect. That's not what it says, is it? To all people. And notice what it says right here in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Soter, which is Christ the Lord, the Mashiach and Lord. Lord means ownership, master. And he's the anointed Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is his full title. Now what we have here in verse number 10 is this. I bring you good tidings of great joy. It's great joy for the world for Christ to be born into it. Now think about it tonight. Can you imagine this world without the Lord Jesus Christ? And having never heard of him, there's no New Testament. You carry your bodies of your loved ones out to the graveyard with no hope of ever seeing them again. And the finality of death will slap you in the face. And boy, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. They don't do much of it anymore, but when I was a kid, they used to go to the graveyard, and, and when they lowered the casket down beneath the dirt, they'd throw dirt on top of the casket. The family would take a handful. The family would be the first ones. And this, of course, was their way of, of uh, the finality of this life. And you just sang about it a moment ago in that, in that hymnal. And so without Christ and without hope, there is no joy in this world. Joy is a strange thing, and it's not something you can manufacture. You can't reach up and push a button, download it from the Internet. It's not something you can read a book and just all of a sudden it becomes yours if you claim it. Joy is something that's directly associated with the Holy Spirit of God. Matthew chapter number 2 and verse 10 says this, And when they'd heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now these were the Magi that came from the east. They came from the Persian, the Gulf, the area of Persia, from the area of Zoroastrianism. Zoroaster lived before Christ, and it was an ancient religion. And the basic uh, fundamental belief of Zoroaster was that it's a duality. In other words, you've got a good God and a bad God. You've got good and evil, and they are both powerful and essentially the same in power. That's duality. And so therefore, one wrestles against the other all the time. That's dualism. This is what yin and yang is about. When you get into a circle, and you've seen yin and yang, you've got the good and the bad, but they're both within a circle. Both of them are equally as powerful. That's dualism. I don't believe that. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is all powerful. And for Satan to exist and for evil to exist, God has a reason for it. But these people came from the darkness, and they had followed the light they had. Now, there's a lot could be said. There's a lot of speculation about who these men were. You know, the, the most plausible is that when Daniel was in Babylonian captivity, he wrote scripture while he was there. And while Daniel was in Babylon, the heart of idolatry, having written scripture, 
You have Ezekiel that is writing scripture. And all of these scriptures are being written and they're coming forth from the Jews. It no doubt probably affected these people around them. Because the soothsayers and the magicians and all of that were about to be put to death at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And had it not been for Daniel being able to step up and read, first of all, he told him what his dream was, then he gave you the interpretation of that dream, and no doubt they took notice. And so maybe many of them watched Daniel and read his work, and of course Daniel prophesied of the coming of the Lord. Daniel chapter number 9 is 70 weeks of Daniel. And we read that, and so no doubt they were probably had been exposed to Scripture, and they were following what little light they had. But it brought them to Christ, and they rejoiced with joy. Hallelujah to God. The birth of Christ is something to rejoice about. Amen. Amen. Now, chronologically, you know, it's a beautiful scene when you see the wise men and the shepherds and all of that around the manger scene. That's all beautiful, but that has nothing to do with reality. They showed up when he was a young child in a house. The shepherds show up when he's a babe in a manger. But they still rejoiced with joy because of the birth of Christ. Because they understood something marvelous had happened. You take these shepherds, for example. They're out in a dark field. They're watching over sheep like a shepherd would. They're protecting these sheep. That's the job of a shepherd. It's his job to, 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 to fight. And in those days, folks, they had lions. Big lions that roamed the countryside. They had bears, wolves, all kinds of predators out there that would like to get a hold of those sheep and carry them off. And so these shepherds fought these things off. A shepherd was a brave man, believe me. It's not a job for a wimp. These shepherds were, they carried their staff, they, can't, they, were, they were used to the outside, and they would fight to protect those sheep. So they were cur courageous men. I mean, they, if look at, da look at David. He said in the Old Testament, he talked about how that he fought off the wolf. He would take a lamb out of the mouth of a lion. And he would protect his sheep. And yet when that angel showed up, it scared him to death. <laughs> but of course, it's not every day you run, up and run into an angel, right? And this is just an angel. You know, just a run-of-the-mill, everyday angel. <laughs> what do you think you'd do if God showed up? <laughs> In Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 22, here's what it says. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. There's no law written for that because it's above the law. It has nothing to do with the law. These are all gifts of grace. The law and grace, don't come, they're, they're incompatible. The law can only condemn you and show you where you're wrong. Grace can pull you out of the clutches of the condemnation. Grace can reach down where the law can only put you down and condemn you. It's a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. But grace will reach in there and with that long outstretched arm like he did in Egypt, he'll pull you out. And that's what he's talking about here. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruits. Plural, but fruit singular. And one of these is joy. So how do you get joy? Well, you can't have joy without the Holy Spirit. First of all, that's as, that's as plain as it can be. You can't have joy without the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, well, now, preacher, I've been, I've been grumpy so long, I don't want any joy. Everybody around you knows that. <laughs> you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell people you're grumpy. I marvel at how people, I, I've seen people down through the years, they'll come down, they'll get right with God, and they really do genuinely get right with God. And they'll get up and they'll give their testimony and they'll say, nobody really understood what kind of life I was living. And I thought to myself, they all knew, son. They could tell there was no power in your life, no joy in your life, no fruit in your life. You were as dead, twice dead, and plucked up by the roots. And have you noticed how that your friends dwindle? People are drawn to joy. They're drawn to courage. They're drawn to victory. There's something about that that's like a magnet. It draws people to it. It's, uh, it's, it infects people. Yes, it spreads. Fear does. And so does courage. And so does joy. If you get, if you get a house full of people full of joy, you don't really need a worship leader. We don't have one here. We never have really missed one. I think we've done pretty good without one, don't you? We don't have a mosh pit down here. We don't bring in, we really don't do much about bringing in Christian celebrities because we've got one big celebrity. 
just one. And I think we've done fairly good. I mean, the church 150 years ago didn't need them. Why should we need them? It's the fact that if you have joy, the joy of the Bible, if you've ever experienced it, you'll always want it again. You can't keep it forever. That's something about human nature that causes it to, to wane. It's not your salvation now. You never lose that. That's not going to leave you. But the joy. And some folks put it this way. They say, well, he's on the mountaintop. Have you ever met that Christian that says, yeah, he's on the mountaintop, but give him time. He'll come down. Do you like it down there in the valley? Do you? <laughs> Misery loves company, doesn't it? How would you like to get up on top of that mountain? Wouldn't you like to have some victory in your life? Amen. It's down in the valley that character's formed. It's down in the valley that you're established in the faith. It's down in the valley you're tried. It's down in the valley where your vision is clearer. It's down in the valley where God can talk to you, where He can't talk to you on the mountaintop. But He can still talk to you on the mountaintop. But you've got to come up out of the valley. In the Song of Solomon, he calls the Shulamite. He says, come with me to the top of the mountain of Amarna. Come with me up to the top of that mountain and let's look off now in the distance. Let me show you some things from up here. It's a wonderful thing when you get up there and you can see. Did you know that? You remember what happened over there when Peter, James, and John were taken to the top of that mountain? You saw what they saw, didn't you? You see what they saw? It's called the Mountain of Transfiguration. The scripture says he, he shone, he transfigured, he was shining. This, our Lord Jesus Christ was not wearing a crown of thorns. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords. They were getting a preview of the future. That's what they were seeing. And boy, it fired them up. And one said, let's build three tabernacles up here. He got a little off on his theology, didn't he? He sure did. But he got real excited about it. He said, it's good to be up here. But I like it up here. Well, I do too. Amen. I, I like it up on top of the mountain. I'm not on top of the mountain right now. But I'm still saved. And I don't think I'm going down into a valley right now. I may be coming out of one. But I'm still saved. It's my, he's my Lord whether I'm on top of the mountain or I'm down in the valley. He's still the Lord. If somebody tells you that you live your whole Christian life up on top of the valley, they're lying to you. Up on top of the mountain, they're lying to you. The Christian life is not like that. The Apostle Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. And in everything and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. There's just something about our nature that won't let us stay up on top of the mountain. But I like it up there, don't you? Amen. You ever been up on top of the mountain? You ever been up on top of these mountains here in East Tennessee? I love these mountains. They're beautiful. They're in our backyard. Folks drive for hundreds of miles to come here and just look at these mountains. Can you imagine those flatlanders up in Indiana when they drive down here? Flatlander. Man, as far as you can see, it's flat as a flitter. And these folks that come up from Florida, I think the biggest hill down there is 30 feet high. <laughs> They come up from Florida, they drive up here and hear these smoky mountains open up before them. You talk about a view. My, they see that and, and I've had them tell me, they said, man, that's, it's magnificent. And it is. It is. You know, the, 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 the what do they call the, the geologists, I guess that's the one, that they tell you that the smoky mountains are a lot older than the rocky mountains. They say the smokies are much older because they're rounded. And the Rocky Mountains are, are, are just, you know, they're, they're just jagged and they project right up out of the ground. And so forth and so on. And the same fellow that tells you that tells you, you know what it was like 60 million years ago? <laughs> and I say to him, no, I don't have a clue. Man, you're old. You've been around 60 million years, have you? You know what was here 60 million years ago? You know, you have to kind of humor people, don't you? Get along with them. Well, I appreciate that. You, you got a PhD? Good for you. <laughs> 60 million years. <laughs> no kidding. 60 million years? Let me tell you about the one that's been forever. Amen. For a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. Amen. So I want to get back up on the mountain. And if I get back up on the mountain, you see me, you see me shouting and turning cartwheels and jumping up and down and climbing the walls and running the pews. Don't get mad at me. Because if you get back up there, you might do the same thing. You know, it might scare you to death if you ever shout it. <laughs> and I'm not talking about voice. I'm talking about shouting in here. 
And you may come out of your mouth. You know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Joy. That's what we're missing. It's hard to have victory without joy. The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. That's for us. His glory will be revealed for His body, His bride. That's us. Yes, it will. We will see the King in His glory. Yes, we will. I'm looking forward to the day when I'm standing there singing. God will let me sing one day. Right now, make a joyful noise. But the day will come when I'll sing. And the day when it comes when I'll sing, I'll look around me and there will be billions. That's with a B. There will be billions gathered around there all singing the same song. Can you imagine what that will be like? Can you imagine? That's a choir. That's a choir, brother. That's what it was for to begin with. Once it's over and you're with Him, you'll understand why you were made. You'll understand God's purpose. Right now, the Bible says that through the church might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. Paul said that in Ephesians. Think about that. That through the church might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. That's a thinker. That's the kind of thing that you go home and you think, well, now what does that really mean? Well, that's God. That's God. That's God. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter number 4 and verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So there's going to be times when you suffer. The Apostle Peter was writing contemporary to Nero. Nero died in 64 AD by his own hand. He committed suicide. Nero burned Rome to the ground. He blamed the Christians and the Jews. He had to blame somebody. And so he blamed them. And they, his own senate turned on him because they knew he was a madman. And you can read the letters that were written back there, and you can read about how that they hated the Christians. And the reason they hated the Christians is because the Christians, they said, were hateful. They accused Christians of being hateful. Now think about that. Does that sound like 2018 right here in this country? They accused the Christians of being hateful. Why were they hateful, preacher? Because they preached one God. They preached one God. Our brothers and our sisters in the first century preached one God. And the Pontifus Maximus, which he called himself, and his vestal virgins and the perpetual fire and all the stuff that went along with the, with, the, with the deification of the Caesar of Rome, the early Christians rejected. And they said there's just one God and he's invisible and you can't see him. But on the cross he died. And they called that a vile, despicable doctrine. Vile and despicable. You can read their letters. Vile and despicable. And they taught, the first, first century Christians taught that this man died for your sins. Bringing it down personally. And you ought to hear what Will Durant says in his history of civilization. He never was a Christian. Died, he died an infidel. Lived his whole life an infidel. But his book on history... <laughs> books, volumes, it's this wide. He talks about Rome 2,000 years ago, and he pulls no punches. Will Durant says Rome, to paraphrase him, was one of the filthiest places on the face of the earth. Men and women doing everything under the sun. Wives swapped and all of it. It was a horrible hell hole. And the Christians preached against it. Therefore, they were hateful. They preached Hate. You getting anything? You understand what's going on now? See how history repeats itself? You're accused of hate speech when you don't accept the contemporary uh, social order in America. You're preaching hate. And they think they're new with stuff, don't they? Nothing new under the sun. They're not preaching a thing new. It's all been preached before. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 8, 2, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality. A trial of affliction. Why does God let his people suffer, preacher? For one thing, a suffering Christian is a preaching Christian. Because a suffering Christian is going to be watched like you wouldn't believe. Do you think an unsaved world, do you think a man out here struggling... A man struggling to pay his debts. Uh, a single mother that has two or three children that she has to raise. Work two jobs. 
You think these people out here then they can't get health care? They got all kinds of problems going on here. And some health and wealth and prosperity preacher driving his Bentley and hath millions in the bank and he lives in his multi million dollar mansion. Does he relate to these people? No. No. But if this woman is a nurse and she's working in a hospital and this Christian is suffering, and this nurse knows she's suffering because she's a professional health worker. She knows suffering when she sees it. And yet the joy of the Lord is all over the face of that Christian. And she can't do anything but glorify God. Which one do you think has a testimony for the Lord? The health, wealth, name it, claim it crowd in their Bentleys and their multi-million dollar bank accounts and their mansions? Or that dear saint that's suffering and with her faith in God. John chapter 15 verse 11. These things have I spoken to you that your joy might remain in you. And that your joy that... Now let me read this again. I messed this up. John fifteen eleven. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. And that your joy might be full. The Lord said that. He said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I thee. I give you my peace. But then he said, I'm going to give you my joy too. The scripture says that for the joy that was set before him, right? He endured the cross, despising the shame, right? The joy set before him. Christ lived every day of his life with the cross and beyond the cross in view. He set his face like a flint. He knew what he was here for. He never deviated one time from that path. He knew exactly why he was born. He was the God-man. The God-man. At 12 years of age, when he walked into the temple, and the doctors of the law, men like Maimonides. Now, Maimonides wasn't alive at that time, but he's a doctor of the law. Well-read, learned men, brilliant men. We're sitting in that temple discussing the Old Testament, discussing the Torah, the written law and the oral law. Here they are, gathered together. The mind of Israel, they're in the temple, that's where they should be. The, the smartest, brightest minds in all of Israel. And a 12-year-old boy walks into their midst and confounds them with his knowledge of the Bible. Amen. 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 My joy. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 Whom having not seen you love, in whom thou you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. David prayed this in Psalm 51. He said, Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. There is no person... That, listen. Have you ever looked into the eyes of of a guru or a monk or somebody in one of these pagan infidel religions. They may be hopped up on dope. They may be in a trance. They may live in an altered state of consciousness most of their lives. But you look into their face. There's no joy there. They're detached. Why are they detached? They can't handle where they are. There's no. That's not joy. What's joy? Joy is being able to look right into the face of hell and know whom you have believed and know that he's able to keep that which you've committed to him against that day and to know where you're going when you leave this world. And our brothers and our sisters have done that for 2,000 years with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. There's nothing like it, folks. And I don't know how in here tonight, it's, it's, you know, it's not my business to pry into your personal life when it comes to some of these things. But do you have the joy of the Lord tonight? I mean, you answer that yourself, see. Do you have? Well, good. If you do, good. Good. Hallelujah. But do all of you have the joy of the Lord tonight? See? Many of you say, well, no, I don't have. I know I'm saved and I love the Lord. Amen. Good. That's your foundation. I'm saved. I believe the Bible. I love the Lord. Amen. That doesn't change. But is the joy of the Lord in your soul? 
that you have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Listen, folks, I just confessed to you a few minutes ago, this preacher doesn't have joy unspeakable and full of glory all the time. I've seen some preachers lead you to think that all oh, they, they never come off of the mountaintop and they have a person and every, every evening about five o'clock they this great mist comes in, gathers around them and, and they gather behind some rock somewhere and they have this great vision from God. It's not like this. This old boy right here, I don't live like that. <laughs> I get skint up, I fall and I stump my toe and I get cut and I bleed and I hurt. And so what do you do then, preacher? Open my Bible, start praying. I open my Bible and start praying. I spent two days dealing with an infidel. Two days. Two days. Did a lot of praying. Oh, I never met anybody personally. I'm talking about what he wrote. He's got a website that says Jesus did not exist. Be careful. You don't want to read it. I'll warn you. He will take your Bible apart. And he will use history and twist it. To try to destroy your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus never existed, he said. Now, he's an infidel. He's an atheist. Because if Jesus did exist, he's condemned. So he has to do away with him. So the first day I read it, I said, now, Lord, this is tough. <laughs> it's hard stuff. The Lord said, I know it is, son. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? He said, I want you to study it. I want you to study it. So you can help others. I want you to get in it. I want you to read it. I want you to pray over it. And I'll show you what you need to know. To help others. And destroy his foundation. That's what I'm supposed to do. See I'm the pastor. I've got to stop the wolf. I've got to deal with the lion. I've got to stop the bear. And I won't play games with him. I watch for your souls. That's my job. My job is to deal with infidels that would destroy your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so pray for me. Would you do that? Pray for me. Pray for me. Because I could tell their word doth eat as a canker. Have you been listening to people who have eaten away at your faith? Have you been running with the wrong crowd? The old man, folks, will never have faith in Christ. I've got an old man that's just as dead as he's ever been dead. But there's a new man inside me that came alive in 1973. And that can't change. And they can't explain it away. You remember I told you Sunday that I used to play pinball machines while they were having church down here at Third Creek? I played pinball machines. I didn't care anything about church. And every time that I ever went to church, my wife drugged me in there. And she had to drag me to get me in there. All I'd do is sit back there like this and listen to that preacher up there. And I'd say, what a fool. Amen. That's what I was thinking inside. You're a fool, man. Well, you're a crazy old religious nut. And then I'd look around all the people sitting in that congregation, that auditorium. And I'd say, you're just a bunch of, just a bunch of wimps in here. Your crutch is religion. I've never heard an infidel, I've never heard an agnostic, I've never heard an atheist say anything that I didn't say until I was 27 years old. And something happened to me that you can't explain unless it's happened to you. Something came down on me that I've never felt before. Somebody came to me that I had never known. Something so powerful got a hold of me that he completely changed me. And I mean it was instantaneous. I didn't have a bunch of questions for God. The day after I got saved, I didn't open up a Bible or I didn't go down to an altar somewhere and say, Now, Lord, would you help me with all this stuff? No. All of a sudden, it was all gone. It didn't exist anymore. I just had a heart full of joy. I was saved. My sins were forgiven. And now the one that I used to cuss and blaspheme and have no need for... <laughs> I now was praying to him and loved him and couldn't wait to get in church. I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. Now please explain to me tonight what that is, if that's not salvation. Oh yeah, she, she's long-suffering to me. <laughs> she, she was long-suffering. 
Bill Cargill baptized me down at Third Creek. After I, I forget, I don't remember how long it was after I was saved. It wasn't but a week or two or something. But Bill Cardwell was the pastor down there, and he baptized me. He baptized her, too, at the same time. She'd already been baptized. She was saved when she was a teenager. But she wanted to be baptized with me. And I thought that was, I thought that was wonderful. She said, where's that at in the Bible? I don't know where it is in the Bible, but she got baptized with me. Is that bad? No. No. No, she just wanted to identify with her husband because she knew her husband had changed. Folks, she married me when I was in the military. I was in the military. I'd been gone from the States a long time. You guys been in the military? You guys been in the military? If you've been in the military, you have a little bit of understanding what I'm talking about. I had been all over this world. And when I came back to East Tennessee, I came back a different person than I did when I left rural high school. Because I had seen too much. But then God met me. He met me. And the joy that I felt then was the most wonderful thing in the world. Have you ever had that joy? Have you ever had a personal experience of salvation with the Lord? There's nothing like it, folks. Nothing like it. Nothing. I want to tell people about it. Father Jesus' name, bless your word. Bless your word. Bless what's done tonight. Father, write it in the hearts of the people. Lord, I know your word is true, Father. It's not about me. It's about your word. And I'm simply one who has benefited and enjoyed greatly what you've done for me. In your holy name I pray and for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen.